Ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, thanks for inviting me to give uh, also talk on um, radiation exposure. And uh, since there are two other talks on uh, radiation uh, reduction techniques, I thought I uh, do something like like an opening a discussion to to present some statistics, especially in uh, which was done uh, in Switzerland. On, uh, on this subject, just to know uh, where is uh, radiation exposure coming from and what are already simple measures to bring down radiation exposure to patients uh, uh, and the staff. And then the other two talks, I think, will illuminate uh, new technological possibilities to uh, reduce radiation burden. So um, I will start with uh, some information on um, radiation exposure on uh, medical imaging. And there I'll present essentially some uh, statistics which we did together uh, with our federal, uh, with the section of radio protection of the Federal Bureau of Public Health in Switzerland, focusing on uh, PET-CT and therapy. And then, uh, as already said, uh, some measures to decrease exposure. And since it's not covered in the other uh, lectures, just two words on the role of pet in radiation exposure. So when looking in Switzerland, uh, just what are the sources of ir irradiation here is what we have as radiation burden to every Swiss citizen around about a year. So uh, wh what is quite important in Switzerland, we have some uh, considerable uh, radon and um, dissonance irradiation, which is quite particular for Switzerland then uh, 1.2 millisievert per year is coming from uh, medical uh, imaging, medical applications, and then uh, the rest, uh, radi uh, cosmic radiation, terrestrial uh, irradiation, and internal uh, radiation. What, what is interesting already bet uh, between uh, two, 1998 and 2004, there was already a, a global increase from 1.0 to 1.2 millisievert per Swiss uh, citizen and uh, with the uh, new techniques and uh, more and more diagnostic exams application radiologic imaging and nuclear medicine imaging I think uh, this radiation has increased since then so when looking at um, where or how exactly is the, uh, uh, the radiation composed sources of uh, in, in radiology, uh, the, just to look at the examination frequency, well, um, 42 percent is coming from uh, dental uh, radiography, so it's very many exams but with low uh, radiation exposure. 50 percent is coming from, um, from uh, just uh, conventional radiography, only 6 percent is, um, is CT exams, and 2% um, is fluor fluoroscopy exams, but when looking at the collective dose coming from each exam, the things are completely ch changing, so there are more than two-thirds of uh, radiation exposure which are coming from CT, and therefore, um, the, uh, in terms of radiology, our authorities really focus on CT, dim uh, diminishing uh, number of CT exams when possible, and also the irradiation per exam. And uh, quite important to note with the dual imaging uh, mod, uh, modalities such as PET-CT, SPECT-CT, uh, CT also plays a, an important role in the uh, exposure to the patients in nuclear medicine. When looking now more specifically at uh, nuclear medicine, uh, comparing 2004 and 2010, um, in the former years, well, um, we had 40% of uh, bone scans, uh, almost 30% uh, other uh, nuclear medicine exams, 23% of um, nuclear cardiology, and only 8% of PET. And now when looking at 2010, this also has completely changed. We are performing much, much more um, PET exams. It, grow, it grew up from 8 to 21%. Bone scans have been uh, diminishing, also cardiac scans and other applications have been <coughs> uh, augmenting. Here's a card of Switzerland and just to look uh, where the PET centers are concentrated and um, light, uh, on, unfortunately I don't have a pointer. 
On, uh, just down on the left-hand side, where the, the, the three blue points, this is the Geneva region, so there's really a, a, an important concentration of PET scanners in, in the Geneva and, uh, or in the Lake Geneva region. Another important, uh, another, uh, important uh, concentration is, uh, can be seen here in, in the Basel region. There are three scanners. Then there are also uh, there's one uh, in Bern where, where I'm living personally. This one uh, is Neuchatel, that is where I'm working, um, which is uh, at this time a mobile PET-CT unit, but with, which will be uh, replaced by a fixed uh, unit. And uh, in the other regions, there are not th that much PET scanners. When looking uh, how are the scanners specified, um, and uh, there everybody can see most of it is uh, oncologic imaging and to do state-of-the-art nowadays PET oncologic imaging. Most of, of the centers are working with 6 and slice CTs. There are a few old ones who are working with 4 and 6 slice CTs. For example, the, the mobile unit which we are using in Neuchatel is a 6 slice CT. And then there are, uh, from, from one of the vendors, they are coming up now with uh, one or dual source 40 slice um, CT and some uh, few centers with uh, specialized, especially cardiac applications, they're working uh, with 64 and 128 slices. So uh, when looking at uh, the number of PET examinations per year, we have a strong trend with every uh, new installation being done and every new uh, indication confirmed. The number is growing up. So uh, we started uh, statistics in 2001 with uh, around about 4,500 exams. Now we are at 20,000. So uh, within nine years, we, we had a five-fold increase of PET-CT exams. And uh, up to now, the top of the iceberg is not yet reached. I think we, once we, we will reach a, a plateau, but now uh, we are still in the growing phase with the PET-CTs. When looking at the tracers which are used, we were, uh, more, well, uh, nobody will be surprised. Most of, of us are using um, FTG, but there's also a whole bunch of other Tracers, especially uh, fluorocorine for uh, prostate cancer, uh, DOPA when available for neuroendocrine tumors or neurologic ap applications, and then all the others with uh, slower, uh, lower numbers of exams. What was also interesting finding, how much does every institution inject in, uh, in terms of FTG for an exam in there? We, we were re really quite, um, quite surprised that there are not that much standards, which are up to now, even if uh, diagnostic reference levels are existing. However, every institution has got its own protocol, so some are working with decrease, uh, increasing um, uh, activities depending on the body weight. Other are using, uh, in, <clears throat> in terms of uh, different uh, body weights or body weight ranges with different activities. And finally, some, uh, some uh, institutions are working with fixed doses independent of body weight. And there also there's some some uh, different things. Okay. So uh, how, how are we working in, in pediatric uh, imaging there? Fortunately, all institutions are working with uh, weight dependent uh, activities, body weight uh, dependent activities. The blue line is the uh, difference, uh, the reference level proposed by uh, the Swiss authority. The red one is uh, proposed by the ENM uh, activity card, and which is quite lower than the <coughs> uh, this one uh, proposed by the Swiss authorities. Another thing is, what are the dose rates uh, on the working place? So uh, exposure to the staff, and uh, there they put uh, dosimeters in a working place or in a room where the staff is working, preparing radiation uh, or preparation of the doses. And what we could see there was uh, that uh, when the, uh, there were activity peaks, when the uh, activity uh, the vial with the activity for the whole day arrived and when preparing the different doses for the patients, for the application, and finally in the end of the day when they were cleaning. And there, we, there were peaks which were noted, and if you 
open the eyes of your personnel to those peaks also they can prepare them and avoid too much radiation protect uh, too much radiation exposure when working clean and limiting presence time uh, close to the radioactivity here is the statistics on the uh, cumulative active active dose per year to the staff and then what we can see there is um, that they used <coughs> uh, we, we had low values uh, till 1993 and then due to introduction of PET and due to also to in, in introduction of new therapeutic uh, agents it went up uh, quite significantly uh, up to 2009 and then uh, we right now we are on a, a plateau and we find the same uh, thing for the extremities so uh, dose emitters of the fingers when they are preparing the doses also there very low values in 1993 and then now growing values with a high energetic uh, radio pharmaceuticals for PET and for uh, therapy we, find, uh, we found a, a, a decrease of the radiation exposure of uh, our co-workers. Just this uh, slide to, to, to see on the one hand how much irradiation do you get to your, to your hands when working for example with technetium 99, 500 megapecarels on the left hand side, F18 and uh, Y90 which is uh, often underestimated because everybody thinks well Y90 uh, just shielding with um, plexiglass there's no more activity uh, well you have to do it if you don't do it especially when preparing a therapeutic dose you get very very much activity uh, onto the fingers on the other hand uh, one can see how much how long does it take to reach 500 millisievert on, onto, onto the fingers um, when looking at Technician M99, it's almost three hours, so um, you can work very, very long to, uh, to arrive at the zeros, but when looking at, uh, at, uh, at Y90, you have 500 millisieverts already in less than one minute, so one other point is limit exposure time of your uh, techs to the different radio pharmaceuticals. Just some words uh, on uh, radionuclide therapy. Here's the cumulative activity which was done um, in Switzerland per year uh, for iodine-131. And there we, we distinguished between uh, ambulatory and hospitalized patients. Ambulatory are the green uh, things and uh, iodine-132 uh, uh, hospitalized are the, 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 the blue columns. And we did uh, s not that much um, uh, ambulatory uh, treatments because uh, we have s very strict radiation um, protection law which does not permit that much. We can give up to 200 megapicarels ambulatory, the rest will be, have to be uh, hospitalized and therefore we, uh, well what you can treat with uh, 200 megapicarels uh, when in patients with hyperthyroidism that are really very very small autonomous nodules or very very small uh, basdo but uh, or graves disease Every, everything uh, which is a little bit bigger a little bit more active or has a little lower um, fixation of iodine one two three in in the dosimetry you already have to uh, to hospitalize them therefore a very very uh, big amount of hospitalized therapies on the other hand when hospitalizing the patients in specialized rooms you can protect at least personnel and environment from too much radiation burden. When looking at the other um, radio, uh, radionuclides used for therapy, uh, for example, rhenium-186 and yttrium-90, which is used for radiation synovectomy, uh, which is done quite frequently in Switzerland, also some rm 153 for treatment of uh, bone metastasis, which is unfortunately really re uh, rather uh, a decrease, a decreasing number. And since 2002, lutetium-177, that was the time when um, the, the new therapy for the neuroendocrine tumors arrived, which is now quite growing. As I already said, uh, in terms of the uh, extremity dose, especially in, uh, in the therapy, here we did um, an examination uh, by positioning um, finger dosimeters at the fingertips 
uh, for every finger and then measured how much is arriving and when looking at how people are using here the um, or holding the vials it is clear that most of the activity will arrive to the uh, to the ring finger and the, uh, the small finger the other ones don't have so much so it's really it's a simple thing just be aware of this keep uh, either uh, do shielding or keep uh, in a greater distance your fingers from the vial so um, just some words about the simple measures to decrease radiation uh, exposure well first thing which is also a medical um, thing we can do first of all verify the appropriateness of the exam or of the therapy this is uh, one big possibility don't do any inappropriate exams which are exposing uh, radiation to the patient or if an exam has to be done is there an exa exam which can be done without radiation if this is not the case it's justified but if it's unjustified leave it the other one is um, to apply the ALARA principle which we can uh, all uh, know very well as low as reasonably achievable so when you can, down, can go down with the doses, go down with the doses in nuclear medicine despite for uh, dynamic examinations we have, uh, we can uh, extend the scanning time in order to have uh, sufficient count statistics for, for our images but when doing uh, dynamic scanning this is not possible but when on the other hand and we will see that later on there are measures to decrease the injected doses apply shielding whenever possible and reduce time of exposure to radiation for the staff as well as for the patients. So uh, on the other hand use state-of-the-art technology there I won't talk too much about that because this is subject of the subsequent talks and finally um, just some words on the role of PET-MR well, when looking at uh, the radiation coming from the different uh, modalities in, uh, in PET, when looking at that, we arrive up to 5.5 uh, millisieverts just for the PET examination there, depending on the CT protocol. We can add uh, between two if you are uh, doing just low-dose attenuation correction and atomic lo uh, localization, up to 20 millisieverts if you're doing full-dose full multiple contrast phases. New uh, techni techniques will allow for decreasing uh, there and when looking at PET-MR on the one hand side with new detector materials uh, and time of flight PET you can also go down with the injected dose and from MR there's no ra radiation coming at all. Just some, some examples of <coughs> uh, an application of PET-MR where to a population where radiation uh, decrease of radiation burn is very important. The pediatric um, population when combining PET with a low dose uh, injection and high quality, con uh, high quality, high contrast MR for example here in a, in a small child with uh, a tumor of the brain stem they had really uh, gives uh, really nice images, high quality images you can distinct the, the tumor even uh, with, with uh, this is FET PET uh, you, you can find other lesions which were first overlooked on, on the MR and just after the, the, the PET session uh, the neuroradiologist just went back to the MR and found, found out that small lesion also in the anterior temporal lobe. You can do this uh, certainly also with um, other isotopes such as uh, the, uh, the, the Tübingen uh, group did it uh, with uh, Dodatoc uh, and Metion, uh, sorry, with, um, Dodatoc or Metionin in, uh, in meningioma as we can see it here on the upside and uh, in another brain tumor uh, glioma uh, as we can see it uh, downstairs and additionally now there are first works uh, who are using also PET-MR uh, for tumor volume delineation for radiotherapy as we can see here. So finally in conclusion there's a constant increase uh, of radiation exposure by medical applications. We are quite aware of that. But there are also simple measures which allow for the uh, limitation of the uh, exposure to both patients and the staff. Technological av advantages are expected to further redu reduce this exposure. 
And finally, the role of PIDMR needs uh, to be determined, but it might also uh, play an important role in that. Finally, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Nicola Stritt, who is the responsive person of the Federal uh, Bureau of Public Health in, in, in Switzerland, uh, who conducted uh, most of the statistics I've been shown with that. I'd like to thank you for your attention.